Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Erwin Stirr, Ken Hayes, Philip Shane, and welcome in our brand new patrons, Free, Bruce, and Jeffrey. Good to have new patrons. Welcome on in. Everybody make them feel at home. On this episode of DTNS, The Verge's Sean Hollister helps us break down Intel's attempt to stay in the AI PC game. AI scientists don't want to be silenced about risk and Instagram's attempt to force you to watch ads. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, June 4th, 2024. I'm Tom Merritt, and I'm in Los Angeles. And I am Sarah Lane, and I'm at Studio Animal House. They're all sleeping. Uh, I am the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, senior editor and founding member of The Verge, Sean Hollister. Welcome back. Hi. <laughs> it's good to have you, man. Hi. That's the sound of someone who's been covering Computex for the past <laughs> rest of his life. Yeah, bad, good to have man. you with us, Sean. No, it's not bad at all. No, I, it's just I was a, nearly going to go, and, and then we decided not to. So. Yeah, yeah, that would have been fun. Because what? It's in Taipei, right? Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I went in 2012. It was a blast. It's been... 12 years since, and I'm yeah. looking forward to it. But Well, uh, we are going to talk about the Intel news out of that with Sean in just a second. Uh, also, we should let you all know Meta announced its Connect 2024 event will take place September 25th and 26th. So put that on your calendars. Let's see what's in the rest of the quick hits. Samsung has added two features to the 32-inch Odyssey OLED G8 gaming monitor. Thanks to the built-in NQ8 AI Gen 3 processor, the monitor can now use use models to upscale content and games to near 4K when you're using the built-in TV and gaming hub apps. There's also a pulsating heat pipe. (laughs) Yep, that's what it's called. That was not announced with the rest of the monitor's details back in January, but this will help prevent burn-in. The 32-inch Odyssey OLED G8 is available now for $1,299. The Raspberry Pi is offering an AI kit. Indeed, uh, it's finally here. Halo's Halo 8L M.2 Accelerator is uh, powering it. Uh, adds 13 tops of power to a Raspberry Pi 5 microcomputer and draws less than 2 watts of power uh, and can be passively cooled. This would let you run some smaller models like coding assistants or image editors on your Raspberry Pi. The information sources say that Apple held talks at the end of last year with China Mobile to bring Apple TV Plus to China. No U.S. streaming video service is currently available in China. If the deal were to be accepted, China Mobile would offer Apple TV Plus for a monthly fee to its customers and reportedly split revenue with Apple. The deal would only likely be for set-top boxes, not phones. There was a breach at the banking company Santander and another one affecting 650 million accounts on Ticketmaster that were both linked to a cloud storage platform called Snowflake. So Snowflake engaged third-party security companies, Mandiant and CrowdStrike, to investigate. They now have reported the results of their investigation. They found no evidence of vulnerabilities on the Snowflake platform or compromised Snowflake personnel accounts. It appears that the breach may have been achieved by accessing Snowflake accounts from clients who did not have multi-factor authentication on. Microsoft 365 Education is the target of complaints from NOIB, N-O-Y-B. That's a privacy watchdog organization based in Europe. They're the ones who single-handedly stopped there from being a user data sharing agreement between the U.S. and Europe for more than a decade. Right now, it's a request for the Austrian Data Protection Authority to investigate some vague terms, the possibility that Microsoft unfairly pushes compliance onto schools, and a tracking cookie that appears to exist without consent. Uh, Quick quiz. Anybody remember what NOIB stands for? I heard this from uh, Rob Dudwood on Daily Tech Headlines today. None of your business. Noib. You know, that that's pri- makes sense. That's pretty sense. good privacy. Yeah, I actually yeah. looked it up just to make sure that I had it spelled right, and I hadn't thought about what it meant. None of your yeah. business. I like it. Uh, well, Intel unveiled its Lunar Lake platform at Computex. Uh, that is its chip that is Copilot Plus compliant. Coming to those kinds of laptops this autumn. Uh, this is just six months after the previous gen Meteor Lake. Intel promises up to 14% faster CPU performance, 50% better graphics performance, and 60% better battery life. Uh, Sean, you've been digging into this directly with the folks from Intel. Uh, what are the things you found most important about Lunar Lake? 
Well, everybody's interested in this being, you know, the new AI chip to go up against uh, the ones from AMD, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, the ones that are going to be in these Copilot Plus PCs. But at next year, nobody's going to care about that because it will be table stakes that all of these chips will have this amount of AI generative processing in them or more thanks to a little coprocessor in Intel, in, in AMD, in Qualcomm chips in your laptops. Everybody's going to have this. So that part doesn't matter quite as much as the fact that Intel has to finally do something about Apple. They have to do something about ARM chips, ARM chips using a different uh, instruction set than the x86 chips that Intel and AMD have been building for you know all of our lifetime in computing. Um, a few years back when Apple introduced those M1 processors and said, hey, we're going to build our own ARM chips, all of a sudden we're like, here is a tremendous amount more battery life from a laptop. The processing is good. It doesn't need as much cooling. And it's beyond time for Intel to do something about that. This is Intel coming out swinging there. Yeah, I thought you did a great job uh, in the article on The Verge, sort of breaking down the comparison, the simplicity, what's going on in these chips. Uh, and a lot of it sounded very much like uh, an M-series chip, right? There's integrated RAM, uh, there's a, a simpler die. Uh, it, walk us through a little bit of the, the highlights of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So last year, Intel did for what, what it called its biggest architectural shift in 40 years, and what that broke down to was we are building our chips more like smartphones in almost every way. Uh, it, for many, many years, smartphones have built their chips. Uh, they call them system on chip in that you have all the different components of the system, the Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth, the cellular connectivity that is a phone, the processing, the graphics, all of them are little building blocks on the same die. So Intel started doing that last year. But like you said, six months later, they've thrown out <laughs> A lot of that to try doing it again because what they did last time didn't quite work. Their first step, it didn't quite work. So the first time they said, we're going to have tiny cores, we're going to have medium cores, and we're going to have big cores. In addition to our graphics cores, in addition to our AI cores, we're going to put all these cores together and we're going to put the right loads in the right place at the right time. And so they built um, some Windows scheduling with Microsoft so that they could theoretically run most of your apps on these tiny, tiny, tiny cores so that unless you were doing something big with your computer, you could save a lot of battery life by keeping your tasks on this low power island. So the low power island still exists this year, but they have ditched those tiny cores entirely. They could not keep the tasks on that low power island the way they want. They were eating up too much battery. Uh, so they said, we're going to make some better medium cores. They have, they call them the efficiency cores, the E cores. They've been around for a while, but the ones this year are so much more powerful and potentially so much more efficient. We would know for sure if Intel ever labeled the axes on its charts, but it doesn't. Uh, mm. They are so much more powerful and so much more efficient that not only do they uh, deliver, I, I think it's two times more performance, uh, excuse me, up to four times more performance than the tiny cores did last year. But they also can deliver more performance at the same power as the P cores, the performance cores in last year's chips. So today's E cores, more powerful than last year's P cores at the kinds of lower clock speeds you typically run a laptop at. Yeah, and so and so that containment that you're talking about with Windows still exists, but it just keeps them on these efficiency cores that are at par with last year's power cores. So most of the time, you'll get that great battery life, it sounds like. Yeah, we're not clear about the technical details, uh, the difference between uh, last year, the scheduler saying, oh, we mm -hmm. think these apps should be here in the low power cores, and now we should move them to high cores. And what they're now calling containment zones, which is like, we are keeping them on the E core. We are keeping Microsoft Teams mm -hmm. will run almost entirely in your E cores now. And so when you're doing your video call, at least with Microsoft's video calling solution, uh, they say you'll get 35% better battery life out of that, which, you know, before they were heating up the entire chip, it was using up unnecessary yeah. amounts of power. Uh, integrated RAM is going to be new for Intel users. Uh, people with Macs and, and ARM processors uh, in general have, have gotten used to that. But this is only going to have 16 and 32 gigs of RAM, and that's all you get, right? 
yeah, this might be the biggest shift uh, for anybody who is uh, who is who likes to tinker with PCs or build your own PCs. If you expect to do that kind of thing with your laptop, if you expect to open up a hatch on the back of your laptop and add additional memory sticks, that is not happening with Lunar Lake at all. Now, again, this is not unusual for smartphones. Smartphones mm -hmm. have had memory on top, sitting on top of the chip for many, many years now. But now Intel is doing that too. There's two chunks of memory that'll physically sit below the um, the CPU would, that has all the compute tiles and different tiles in it. Uh, the memory will now be part of the same package that the, your heat sink goes on top of. And so if you want more than 32 gigabytes of memory, you're out of luck. Thankfully, you get a minimum of 16, whereas some of the competition still ships laptops with eight gigabytes of memory. Yeah, you get yeah. 16 at a minimum. Yeah, and Arrowhead Lake is is coming. That's more of a desktop PC. Uh, but they, they say if you want to do upgradable RAM, look for that. I thought it was just for desktop, but Aero Lake will be laptop and desktop. They planned to do that with Interesting. Okay, Meteor to Lake too. There were uh -huh. Meteor Lake desktop parts. That is Meteor Lake being last year's chips. They got canceled. They did not come out. Um, so folks on desktop had to move directly to a different uh, system. But now lunar lake maybe exclusively for these thin laptops arrow lake laptop and desktop when it comes yeah to and thank you it's arrow lake not arrow arrowhead is water arrow lake is the chip <laughs> there <laughs> uh, is an arrowhead lake though yes exactly so, yeah uh before we let you go uh how do you think this stacks up with amd's announcement with the ryzen ai 300 announcement from yesterday uh, I believe AMD is going to be in a similar place as Intel when it comes to that AI co-processing. Um, I imagine, I imagine that the Intel chips could be more powerful, but there's something, I feel like there's something that Intel isn't telling us. I don't know what it is. When I spoke to their, their marketing guru, Rob Halleck, Intel, Intel said is their marketing guru, Rob Halleck. He told me, um, I think his quote was that he expects Lunar Lake laptops to be the tippy top of the mountain. That's what he said. Tippy top mm -hmm. of the mountain when they ship later this year. And so he's, when he says that, I verified with him that he meant the, he believes these will be more performant, have better battery life than AMD's Strix Point, which is those AI mm -hmm. 300 chips, uh, and Qualcomm. He thinks they will be better than Qualcomm. But Intel is not letting people touch Lunar Lake mm. yet. Uh, it has not shared crucial things like how fast will these chips be in terms of uh, in terms of gigahertz? Because if, for instance, uh, if if you take if you take for granted that they're that they're telling the truth that it will be you know sixteen percent faster CPU speed, uh, clock for clock, uh, with, compared to Meteor Lake, uh, it is. 16% faster clock for clock, meaning if they are at the same clock speed. But mm -hmm. if Lunar Lake runs at a slower clock speed than, uh, than Meteor mm -hmm. Lake, you may not see a 16% improvement in CPU performance. It's possible that these get better battery life, better AI, but maybe don't have faster performance than last year's chips. And I would say that for many, many years now, uh, I have not felt like buying a new processor for an x86 computer has made my computer faster. Um, it feels like it's only keeping up with whatever the, the increases in software yeah, uh, yeah. do. Well, uh, you know, the, the chips, the Lunar Lake chips are coming in Q3. Arrow Lake's supposed to be in Q4. Lunar Lake has an MPU with 48 tops. If you're keeping score, that makes it Copilot Plus. Wi-Fi 7, Bluetooth 5.4, two Thunderbolt 4 ports just as, as part of the chipset. Guaranteed. Else? They say every yeah. laptop will have two Thunderbolt yeah. ports now. So yeah. theoretically, left side, right side, you plug in your cable, you'll get fast charging and data no matter which Lunar Lake laptop you buy. That right there, something to celebrate, I think. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Uh, we'll definitely go read Sean's full article. He's got all the details uh, at The Verge. Uh, and before we go, anything else you want to tell folks about, Sean? No, I'm good. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Go check it out, theverge.com. Sean Hollister, thank you so much. Have a great one. Thanks, you Sean. You too. Well, Instagram confirmed it is testing unskippable ads in its feed. Various users have come across the test. Uh, it has a countdown timer letting you know how long before you can resume scrolling. Uh, Instagram, while confirming that that test was actually real, uh, didn't give any more details on the test, but said, hey, you know, if we end up making this permanent, we'll tell you all about it someday. Uh, 
Anyone besides an advertiser who would like this to become permanent, do you think, Sarah? No, no. I don't think anybody wants this. I also think people are used to this. Um, anybody who spends time on YouTube and doesn't pay for YouTube Premium is going to have at least a few seconds of ads, even skippable ads. You still have to sit through a few seconds of them. Um, and in some cases, you know, you don't even have the options to skip. So this is not abnormal. And I really don't, I mean, I was about to say, I don't fault Instagram for doing this. I mean, it, it's as a user, no, nobody wants this, but it's sort of like, okay, Instagram has a few options. You either make people pay for an ad free version of the service, um, which could possibly be a thing. You do this sort of like, hey, you can't get away from the ads and sometimes you can't scroll past them and that's just part of the deal. Or uh, what's the alternative? Uh, that Because the company wants to make money. That's that's the bottom line here. Uh, so so how do you how do you annoy the users but not enough for the user to just say like, okay, I don't want to hang out here anymore. Would you partner with popular creators, take a cut of the creator's cut. I mean, that's already happening, but you know, you get to the point with, uh, a platform like Instagram and what, 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 what else do we expect? Yeah. I didn't expect unskippable ads in Instagram because it is contrary to the user experience. It's one thing in a video where we're all used to pre-roll ads for YouTube to say like, guess what? You can't skip the pre-roll ads anymore. Uh, it is another thing in a, in a system that's been around for 10 plus years to be like, we're built on keeping you scrolling. We are now going to stop you scrolling. I think that's risky. Like, I totally get what you're saying. You're absolutely right. They they want to monetize. And maybe the solution is they'll be like, hey, for $5 a year, you can have no ads in Instagram. Although Instagram is one of those weird places where people seem to kind of like the ads sometimes. Like, I, I actually saw people saying, you know, I use Instagram ads and I bought lots of things from them, but I will stop paying attention to them if they do this. Uh, it's almost like people don't want to get rid of the ads. They like them the way they are in some cases. Some of you are probably reviled by that notion, but I personally, I'm not emotional about it, but I will say I go to Instagram as sort of like a side diversion. And yeah. if I'm scrolling through and suddenly it's like, oh, you have to wait 20 seconds for this ad. I'll just go somewhere else. I won't, I won't go away mad. I'll just go away. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm with you on that. It, I do think Instagram is sort of unique in the sense that, yes, so many things that are Instagram ads are things for sale, easy to buy. Look at this photo set or a video of the cute boots that you were looking at a week ago because we know where you've been, that kind of stuff. It is, it works on Instagram. I have bought, I mean, not that many things uh, based on Instagram ads, but it's its definitely, it captures your attention. Um, if nothing else, especially when uh, Otis the dog is on his Instagram, obviously not me because it's his Instagram account, but he gets served up lots of, you know, like dog bed and dog toy and cute dog hoodie ads. And I mean, it's all I can do not to be like, just click. It's so easy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, right. Just one click. <laughs> but but uh, at the same time, when Instagram ads first rolled out, and I think that was, what are we talking, like 2016? Yeah, something around it, there. It was, it was right around the time that Instagram introduced the algorithmic feed, which at the time, those of us who had been sort of ride or die for the platform were just like, this is the worst. And now we all just got used to it. You know, it's not going anywhere. It's everywhere. But uh, at the time, I, you know, I'd say hide ad. <laughs> Every ad I saw, hide. And I'd be like, eh, they, we'll just run out eventually. No, that's not what happened. Uh, they just came back in force. And now I just, I just deal with them. But, yeah, yeah, we're all used to it now. Yeah, but yeah, that whole sort of, you can't scroll without watching the ad. Um, it That tends to, anytime that happens to me in any similar form where I'm sort of forced to deal with an ad, I'm just like, la, 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 do not care. You yeah. know, I, I am fighting you now. And, you know, it's just not a great experience. I suspect that there's a principle of the internet that more people complain about a thing than will actually act on it. So I think that is worth taking into account here. Yeah. Uh, but there is a principle of 
you know, I've seen many people, I think Stoic Squirrel just said it. I've seen lots of other people say, well, if the ads are good, you won't skip them anyway. So why force people to watch them? Uh, and that is a principle that if it were a hundred percent true, there would never be unskippable ads, right? Uh, apparently unskippable ads are effective because the advertising world wants them. Uh, and that's why Instagram is testing it to be fair to Instagram. They're testing it. They're seeing, does this cause people to stop scrolling? Uh, and if it does, they won't continue with it and they'll be able to tell their advertisers. Yeah, here's the numbers. We did a, we did a search and it doesn't work on our platform. That's kind of what I'm hoping selfishly happens, but you know what, if, if it doesn't stop people from skipping away, if I'm wrong and I'm like, I, you know what, I, even though it's unskippable, I don't skip away. They, if they're like fine tune the exact right amount of time for an ad on Instagram to be unskippable before people, you know, do close, um, we're probably going to be stuck with it. I also, you know, you mentioned something like $5 a year to not get ads. I mean, if it was really that low, I'd be like, yeah, of course. I'd probably I mean, do it for have $5 to be. a month. I, I, in this world where people are paying $20 a month for Netflix, you know, Instagram's going to have to be really cheap if all you're doing exactly. is taking away the ads. Exactly. But yeah. it, it also, and, and again, this is completely different from the hoaxes that go around every so often where they're like, all right, Facebook is, you know, going to make you pay. Yeah, it's like yeah, it's yeah. like he's like no fa Meta, Facebook, WhatsApp, anything under you know in, in the uh, the Meta universe, they are not going to force you to pay for their products. No. They're they're going to force you to pay for the version of the product that you want, possibly. But yeah, we're 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 definitely in the testing phase right now. And Larry in Atlanta asked, "Will Instagram charge advertisers to make their ads unskippable?" Yes, yeah, they'll, they'll be able to charge charge more. They'll be able to ha charge a higher CPM, as they call it, if oh, an ad I, is unskippable. Right? I mean, that's imagine that's the being idea. In the marketing room, you know, where you figured out the perfect slogan, which is at the end of the ad, <laughs> you're like, "No, people need to see the whole ad." Yeah, we all work they, very hard on this. The advertiser believes that the ad will be more effective if it's unskippable. That's why they want it. And if it turns out that that's true on this test, then Instagram can charge more for it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, it's been uh, an exciting week at Computex already. And next week uh, is no different. Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference, WWDC, is next week. And Apple Vision Show is on it, y'all. Each week, Eileen Rivera and I talk all things Apple well, also keeping an eye on the competition as well. We want to know what everybody's doing in the space. Do join us at applevisionshow.com. More than two dozen current and former employees of OpenAI, Google's DeepMind, and Anthropic signed a letter posted at righttowarn.ai called a right to warn about advanced artificial intelligence. So... The URL is very apropos. Seven of the 26 signees used their name. The rest were anonymous. The letter was also endorsed by AI pioneers Yoshua Bengio, Jeffrey Hinton, and Stuart Russell. The letter called on advanced AI companies to commit to four principles allowing employees to anonymously raise concerns about AI risks without fearing retaliation of being sued for violation of confidentiality agreements. The letter specifically called for the protection of trade secrets and intellectual property when raising concerns in four specific categories. So specifically, no prohibitions on disparagement of a company over risk-related concerns. So if I work for a company or otherwise know about something that the company is doing, uh, I don't have to worry about legality. A process for anonymously raising concerns to company boards, regulators, or appropriate independent organizations. Kind of piggybacking off of, of step one, but same idea. Number three, support for a culture of open criticism. Mm -hmm. We should all say how we feel. Number four, promise to not retaliate for raising risk-related concerns in public if all other processes have failed. Yeah, so this is this is this is tricky uh, because uh, if you are a lawyer, uh, and I, I've I've worked with many great lawyers who've, who've expressed that this is often the way lawyers work, uh, you tend to say. Let us protect against all possible eventualities. Let's set the line as far away as possible from, from us getting sued. Uh, and so that disparagement thing that you were talking about in that first point, 
uh, is one that they will do when they are giving someone severance pay, for example, uh, mm -hmm. or giving someone stock options. They'll say, you, you will get these options granted. You will get the severance pay if you agree that you will not disparage the company in any way for the next, whatever, five to 10 years. Uh, that's boilerplate. Uh, I've signed one. Sarah signed one. Roger signed one. You know, we've all I've signed gone more through than that. one. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And so, what the lawyer is doing there is saying we don't care what the disparagement is. We're just going to set the line out there as far as possible to avoid that damage. Right. Mm -hmm. What these folks are saying is we get that, and we're and they say in the letter we're we don't want people to reveal intellectual property. We don't want people to reveal trade secrets, but. If they're concerned, legitimately concerned about any kind of harm, and they're they're very broad here, from imminent things like bias uh, or or prejudice to existential threats to humanity, right? They're like right. whatever the legitimate harm they're concerned about, they should have a pathway to do it. And an NDA, a confidentiality agreement, a dis a non disparagement agreement, shouldn't prevent them from warning people about serious risks. It, yeah. It's all going to come down to like, OK, but who gets to define what a serious risk is? Right. In the letter specifically, uh, <laughs> speaking of serious risks, um, uh, the, the, the letter uh, signees said, we also understand the serious risks posed by, posed by these technologies. These risks range from the further entrenchment of existing inequalities to manipulation, misinformation, the loss of control of autonomous AI systems, potentially resulting in human extinction. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, not mincing words here. And, and, you know, it's, it's not as if this letter was written saying humans are about to become extinct and no. these companies, you know, should, you know, need to shut down immediately. Not at all. More, more that, uh, people, there are a lot of people working in this field who care very much and who know what they're talking about and have worked in various systems that are creating AI systems that the rest of the world will then be using. And if there is an issue, we should be able to voice that issue for the good of humankind. Yeah, there's, there's some, some pretty respectable pioneers in AI. Jeffrey Hinton is the one who actually stepped down from Google because he wanted to be independent to shine light on these kinds of risks. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're saying not there are problems. I think a lot of people are going to look at this that way. They're saying if there are problems and there will be some problems of all manners of levels. Uh, right now, there's no way for people to alert folks outside of their immediate manager. And essentially what they're saying in this letter is, we don't think that's good enough because there is a financial interest and a stock investor uh, pressure to err on the side of not revealing a risk that could cause a damaging uh, event to happen. Uh, and they're saying we need a we need to work on a process that allows people to do whistleblowing uh, if if things are risky. And that doesn't mean they're they're saying there are risks right now, but they're saying the possibility is there and there's no path for someone to warn everyone about it that doesn't go through people who have a vested interest in not warning people about it. Well, Tom, knowing, you know, ha having read the letter and uh, I think some very valid points were brought up and I understand what uh, what the what the goal is here. How much do you think this is going to change what OpenAI is doing at its next board meeting, for example? I don't. OpenAI was the only one that responded to this. And they said, we have a hotline that people can call anonymously if they're concerned about something. Uh, we're we're very responsible. <laughs> Trust us. A hotline? Yeah, really? for internal Open employees. AI? They do. Yeah. They have a hotline that you can oh, call. for internal anon employees, yeah. Yeah, okay. for an, an anonymously. But you're, you're warning someone within OpenAI, and that's kind of beside the point of this. This is saying, if they go to a regulator, if they go to a journal, a response responsible journalist, uh, they shouldn't be retaliated against. It's right. the start of a conversation. It's not necessarily a conversation that's going to go anywhere. Anthropic and, and Google have not responded, at least that I have seen as of this recording. Uh, 
but it is it is definitely trying to put some pressure on this and it's going to need someone else to pick up the baton at least on the regulatory side if not on the independent agency side to put pressure on the companies to say you you need to create something like this something akin to what meta does with its oversight board for something much less uh, potentially risky uh, social networks in my opinion uh, a ai i don't think is dangerous right now but certainly has the potential to be used in in dangerous fashions and uh, I'm, I support everything in this letter the way it was written, for sure. Yep, yep, yep. Foresight rather than hindsight. Let's Indeed. do it. Indeed. Well, uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Uh, we're going to talk about the fact that scientists at Cambridge have developed an extra thumb for humans to use. That's right. Uh, you want three <laughs> thumbs? Stick around. We'll tell you how. No, wouldn't you have four thumbs? Oh, just the, th okay. Yeah, Got one it. on oh. each hand and then, yeah. Can't wait to hear more, Tom. Uh, I love thumbs. Why not? Why not both? Who doesn't? Yeah. Uh, just a reminder, you can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we're back doing it all again tomorrow with Scott Johnson joining us. See you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>